Uh, thank you all for joining us again for our, our next uh, paper of the day. And um, before we uh, get into that presentation, I did want to have a moment to welcome uh, the president of Tyndale, uh, Dr. Marjorie Kerr, to bring greetings on behalf of the institution. And uh, she's in her first year as our president, a uh, very strange year to <laughs> take over uh, and any, make any kind of transition, but um, as if the job of being a university president wasn't uh, uh, challenging enough, but uh, we're thankful that she's here and, and uh, she is also one of our, our denominational family of, of, she's a salvationist. So welcome Dr. Kerr. Thank you, James. And hello, everyone. Um, as James said, this is my first year at Tyndale, and it is my first um, experience with this symposium as well, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, it's been good to scan across the uh, screens today and to see so many familiar names and faces of people I have known for short and long time periods. Um, and I hope for those I haven't met today, there are those who I will come to know in the coming months and years as I continue to um, broaden my um, relationships with so many who are connected to Tyndale. But, you know, as mentioned at the start today, we really are delighted to be able to host this symposium again after having to cancel last year in particular. And while we all look forward to being able to gather again in person for all kinds of activities and events, we're nevertheless pleased that the virtual format we're using has significantly increased the number of people who are able to attend from a much broader geography. So whether it is your morning, afternoon, or perhaps even evening, welcome and welcome back. As president of Tyndale, one of my primary responsibilities is always to tell our story and why we are here. And our mission statement makes that very clear. Let me read it to you. Tyndale is dedicated to the pursuit of truth, to excellence in teaching, learning, and research for the enriching of mind, heart, and character, to serve the church and the world for the glory of God. That's what we do. That's why we're here. Everything that we engage in ultimately is to equip women and men to serve the church and the world for the glory of God. And this symposium is an important part of equipping God's people. So whether you are here as a presenter, a participant, or both, I want to just say thank you for engaging in this symposium and conversations that we're having today. I think all of us are seeking to broaden our awareness um, and deepen our understanding of what it means to know God and to understand God. And through these kinds of opportunities, we have the opportunity to do that within and across the denominational, theological, and historical perspectives um, that we each represent. And I do also want to extend a word of thanks to the Wesleyan Studies Committee um, who have made this symposium possible, um, dating all the way back to 2009, as was mentioned this morning. We're grateful for you. You know, if we had the time today, I would love to unpack for you a little bit of all that is taking place within and through this university. Um, new opportunities and challenges, a strong focus on the future we're building while we honor the past and the present, but that will have to wait for another day because I promised James I would wait for another day. But really our hope this afternoon and, and over these next few hours is that you will leave this symposium with perhaps one or two either new insights or maybe they're just refreshed insights. Perhaps there will be a question or two that you're going to puzzle over and, and explore a little further in the days and weeks to come. But whatever that is, we also hope that you will leave with the affirmation of God's continuing presence and working in our lives, in our communities, and in our world that is hurting so badly in these times. So welcome, have a wonderful afternoon, and God bless you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dr. Kerr. It's a pleasure to have you join us uh, today. Um, as we're beginning our next session, I will just, uh, I did want to mention about next year's event. Uh, for those of you who may be interested, we are planning a joint Wesleyan Pentecostal symposium. We did this a few years ago. We did a, a symposium on experience and um, Wesleyan and Pentecostal traditions share a lot of um, 
common ground historically and theologically, although we have significant differences as well. One thing we share is, is that we've been on the forefront of um, bringing, giving women opportunities to serve in leadership in the church. And so we want to explore the role of women, the voice of women in our, in our two traditions and the connections between our two traditions on this question. We have Priscilla Pope Levison from Southern Methodist University, uh, who is obviously a, a Wesleyan Methodist. She's a, study, uh, a specialist in women evangelists. And Linda Ambrose, who some of you may know, is a, is a Canadian historian, a Pentecostal historian, and they're going to be our two keynote speakers. So I uh, hope you'll come back to join us April 26, 2022, for that important event. Thank you, Tabitha. And as we begin, I'll just remind you of what, what we said this morning, that, um, you know, please keep your microphones muted, and, and it's helpful if you keep your camera off as well, just to help uh, focus the bandwidth on our, our, our presenter. So our presenter for this session is uh, Barbara Robinson. Uh, she is an Anglican priest. She serves in the Diocese of Ontario, which is a bit confusing for non-Anglicans, but it's really just Eastern Ontario. That's the name of it, however. And she's uh, it, located in Brockville. Also has a long uh, deep roots in the Salvation Army, a deep knowledge of the Salvation Army, and served in various roles in, in the Salvation Army, including as a faculty member on Booth University College and did doctoral research on Salvation Army history. So really looking forward to your presentation, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're over to Tabitha, I guess, and the screen sharing this afternoon. I earnestly desire him to be electrified. John Wesley, the formative Salvation Army and irregular medicine. Are we to assume uh, that the congregational potluck has become a thing of the past? Even before the pandemic, it had become a more complicated affair. Some fellowships insist that all veg, uh, dishes be labeled gluten-free, keto, vegetarian, vegan. We're urged to buy local, to eat clean, to leave raw. We can even diet like Daniel. Dietary preoccupations, even obsessions, are not novel. In 1900, if you had been invited for dinner at the home of William Booth's son and successor, Bramwell, the meal would have been simple and vegetarian. And had you sat down for tea with John Wesley in 1750, he would likely have nagged you to at least limit your consumption to a single cup and then only with milk and sugar, sending you home to peruse his tract, a letter to a friend concerning tea, printed by William Strawn in December of 1748. The health regimes and therapeutic practices utilized and promoted by John Wesley in the 18th century and those of the Salvation Army's founding family in the 19th century are among the more curious and in the case of Salvationist studies largely unexamined aspects of Wesleyan history. It's easy to skim over John Wesley's enthusiastic descriptions of the installation in the local chapels of electrical machines for the delivery of electric shock, what he termed, quote, a thousand medicines in one, or to read a century later of the Booth family's endorsement of homeopathy and taking the waters at Mr. Smedley's hydropathic establishment and dismiss their therapeutic guidance as quirky, even a bit neurotic. However, the historical study of how health is defined and healthcare is practiced offers what medical historian Wendy Mitchinson terms a quote, a particularly fruitful lens for social scrutiny. The first and most obvious reason for this disciplinary fruitfulness is because it reflects the nature of a perennially popular discourse. People fret about their health and they discuss it. For social historians, the study of domestic or alternative medicine surfaces issues of gender and class, attitudes to authority, to science, to medical professionalism. For a faith-based gathering like this symposium, it offers a lens through which we can compare and contrast 18th and 19th century perspectives on the scope of pastoral care, 
on Christian philanthropic responsibility, on the breadth of mission, and on underlying theological emphases. Both John Wesley and the Booths popularized and published articles, manuals, and tracts of health instruction. Both Wesley and the early army leadership had very practical reasons for doing so. In both centuries, the quest was for accessible, affordable, simple, natural habits or regimes for preserving health and treating illness for populations with very limited opportunities to doctor. Both movements believed that they were seeking and promoting what we would today call evidence-based treatment. But Wesley's primary motivation for the use of domestic or irregular medicine was not quite the same as was that of the booze, nor were their attitudes to the medical orthodoxy of the centuries in which they were. And it's only by taking into account their wider cultural contexts and values, even their quite different class backgrounds, that one can adequately make sense, for example, of the ease with which John Wesley incorporated medical advice into his pastoral work versus Catherine Booth's contrasting dismay at the interest shown by her oldest son, Bramwell, in pursuing a medical career. John Wesley offered basic medical and therapeutic advice in continuity with Anglican pastoral practice of the 17th and early 18th centuries. In the last decade, these historical precedents have been comprehensively explored by Randy Maddox, by James Donnett, by Deborah Madden. When in 1729, Wesley was recalled to his role as a tutor at Lincoln College and tasked with the education of future priests, his diary indicates that he was reading Burnett's Discourse of the Pastoral Care. Several years earlier, he had expressed enthusiasm for George Herbert's Country Parson. Both of these were 17th century works which, included, which encouraged priests to include physic, primarily for the health of their families, but also as a component of their pastoral work. The clergyman was often the only university trained citizen of the community, and the study of physic defined as, quote, the study of human nature and anatomy with an emphasis on the promotion of health regimes to maintain well-being was an element of a broad classical curriculum. Later in life, Wesley would write that as an MA student, he had made, quote, anatomy and physic the diversion of my leisure hours. 20 years would pass, however, before Wesley was moved to openly embrace the role of priest physician, and his motivation seems to have been primarily philanthropic. He wrote, I was still in pain for many of the poor that were sick. There was so great expense and so little profit. I saw the poor people pining away and several families ruined, and that without remedy. At length, I thought of a desperate expedient. I will prepare and give them physic myself. I took into my assistance an apothecary and an experienced surgeon, resolving at the same time not to go out of my depth, but to leave all difficult and complicated cases to such physicians as the patient should choose. I gave notice of this to the society, telling them that all who were ill of chronic distempers, for I did not care to venture upon acute, might, if they pleased, come to me at such a time, and I would give them the best advice I could and the best medicines that I had. Clearly, John Wesley sees himself as offering complementary rather than alternative care. He was quick to defend both domestic healers and those professional physicians committed to what historians have called enlightened empiricism, medical approaches which were relying on the observation of symptoms rather than on Gallen centuries old theoretical system which understood medicine's task as the restoration of balance between the four humors or liquids of the body, the blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Wesley often reviewed with approval the works of orthodox physicians. He often summarized the contents of their medical monograms and texts 
in pamphlets distributed in his missions. For example, in, adv in advices with respect to health extracted from a late author, 1769, Wesley's abridgment commended the prominent Dr. Tissot for his admirable descriptions of disease and a writing style, quote, so clear that even common people of tolerable sense could understand. He was heartened by the fact that Tissot's recommendations for medicines were, quote, exceedingly few and moderately priced. He did question what he described as Dr. Tissot's, quote, violent fondness for bleeding. I think we have a slide showing the patient being bled here. And what he termed the author's, quote, amazing love of glisters, that is enemas. Riley commenting, I wonder whether he himself submitted to or performed the operation. What, I pray, beside extreme necessity, would induce any but a kind of beast of a man either to prescribe it to another or admit himself such a worse than beastly remedy. Wesley seems to have been uniquely conscious of the relationship between physical and mental health. This is evident from the extensive case notes that we find in his diary. He writes, reflecting today on the case of a poor woman who had continual pain on her stomach, I could not but remark the inexcusable negligence of most physicians in cases of this nature. They prescribe drug upon drug without knowing a jot of the matter concerning the root of this disorder. And without knowing this, they cannot cure, though they can murder the patient. When came the woman's pain, which she would never have told had she never been questioned about it, from fretting the death of her son. Wesley goes on to argue that physicians need to, quote, call in the assistance of a minister as ministers when they find the mind disordered by the body, call in the assistance of a physician. Wesley's domestic manual and what turned out to be his best selling book, Primitive Physic, went through 23 editions. It remained in print until 1880. Uh, some of his health advice has stood the test of time. The benefits of a standing desk, walking as the safest, most effective form of exercise. He recommended two to three hours a day of walking for scholars. Cold compress applied to the back of the neck uh, for the nosebleed. Other advice may be a bit less helpful for baldness, an onion rubbed onto the scalp followed by daily electrifying. Or for the common cold, tiny rolls of orange peel stuffed up the nostrils. In Maddox's Introduction to Works, Volume 32, Medical and Health Writings, he identifies two theological assumptions undergirding Wesley's health advice. And I quote, the first is his Anglican-based primitivism. Just as Anglican apologists assumed that Christian life and doctrine were purest at the origin of the Christian church and sought to emulate those times, Wesley privileged the primitive origins of physic and praised, for example, the Native Americans for most closely preserving the pristine practice. And then, of course, Wesley saw plant-based herbal remedies as the concrete evidence of provenient grace. He argued that God would never have allowed the potential damages of sin if God had not also graciously prepared ways to heal these damages. I quote, in light of these convictions, Wesley may have viewed the privileging of chemical medicines over plants as a failure to trust God's long-standing provisions for the effects of sin. The Salvation Army. If Wesley's study of domestic medicine was an expression of his broad-based intellectual and scientific curiosity, with its practice catalyzed primarily by philanthropic concern, this formative Salvation Army's endorsement of alternative medicine 
specifically hydrotherapy, homeopathy, and vegetarianism, was a response to a range of concerns. The ever-present threat of disease in the gritty Victorian cities. The still dismal state of early 19th century medicine. The Booth family's personal experience of illness. A mid 19th century evangelical distrust of medical professionalism. I should also have said uh, Orthodox medicine exclusion of women as practitioners. Uh, the need to ameliorate the army's rigidly activist expectations. What is less evident in salvation discussion, salvationist discussions of health and medicine is the scientific openness, the sheer delight that John Wesley seemed to bring to the topic flowing directly from his profound sense of the manifestation of the goodness of God in creation. You see this much in his sermons like Original Sin and the Fall of Man. The almost obsessive nature of William and Catherine Booth's concern for their personal health, expressed as early as their courtship correspondence, was not without warrant. No one could assume effective medical or therapeutic defense against the onslaught of disease and epidemic, which regularly cut a swath through a vulnerable population. Throughout the 19th century, one citizen in six in Great Britain was infected with tuberculosis, a disease killing more people each year than all other major infections combined. Working class life expectancy at mid-century remained what it had been during Wesley's ministry, 45 years. The Victorians were well acquainted with pandemic, they recalled with horror the cholera outbreaks of 1832, 49, and 1866. Cholera, quote, outlandish, unknown, monstrous, its insidious march over continents, its apparent defiance of all known and concentrated precautions. The historian Bruce Haley goes so far as to assert that no topic more occupied the Victorian mind than health. Not religion, not politics, not improvement or Darwinism. Victorians worshiped the goddess Hygieia, sought out her laws and disciplined themselves to obey them. As had been the case in the 18th century, many Victorian citizens lived without ever receiving professional medical attention. In completing the application form or candidates papers for training as a Salvation Army officers, recruits were asked if they could to produce a medical certificate. Adelaide Cox, the 20 year old daughter of an Anglican vicar commented on her application that this had been dispensed with in her case as she had quote, never needed or had a doctor. This was not an unusual claim. It was also common for people to distrust and avoid the conventional pharmacology. Florence Soper Booth, whose father was an Orthodox physician, credited her mother-in-law, Catherine Booth, with the major influence upon her own approach to health promotion and care. And I think if we just jump to the next slide, Florence writes, it is to her advice that we owe the fact that our children have come through life so far almost entirely without a dose of medicine of any description. The water treatment has sufficed to overcome with ease the childish ailments of whooping cough, measles, the visits to the doctor have been nil. Parallel, paralleling, we just have a couple slides here showing what that water treatment looked like. Had a little bit of dissenting views from George Scott Railton. Um, but anyway, we'll move on. Paralleling John Wesley's 18th century experience, much of the attraction of mid 19th century medicine can be attributed to the harshness and futility of the orthodox alternative. Patient testimonials were dense with references to having been doctored to death, drugged without mercy, 
almost constantly killed by inches for long years. Medicine founded on conjecture, improved by murder. It wasn't until the final quarter of the 19th century that there was a radical turnaround in the valuation of the practice of orthodox medicine among conservative evangelicals like those within the Christian mission and early Salvation Army. At mid 19th century, doctors, especially medical students were highly suspect, criticized for moral laxity, for coarsening, for uh, indications of unholy selfish ambition to achieve high social status and for the godless social scientific materialism which informed their worldviews. Bramwell Booth was 15 years of age when he shared his interest in pursuing a medical career with his evangelist parents, William and Catherine, and they were less than pleased. Biographers of the Booths describe an emotional debate which ended with a devastated Bramwell, quote, shivering from head to foot with sobs on a dining room settee. Catherine Booth's opinion was uncompromising and her influence absolute. The practice of medicine was a vortex which swamped the religion of thousands of promising, piously trained young men. She salted the letters written home to her son while she was away on her preaching engagements with warnings about the humble, earnest Christian she had heard of who, quote, discarded personal faith when he got the ambition to be a doctor and get up in the world. Medical metaphysics, but the eight, 19th century cultural embrace of alternative health practices was more than a practical response to medical impotence and social need. For many transatlantic health and holiness reformers, the physical body became a primary focus of religious concern. Nature, stable, unchanging, orderly, was a universal and readable religious text. To attend to the eternal laws of nature as evidenced in bodily function, was to attend to the voice of God. Not to attend was to reap the consequences as disease. In sectarian medicine's uh, religious language, not only could believers be saved through hygienic reform, they could be sanctified. A rhetoric of purity widely popularized in evangelical journals uh, supported by evangelicals such as the Herald of Health went so far as to claim that clean, natural therapies such as hydrotherapy, homeopathy and vegetarianism held, quote, the power to bring back the human race to its original physical perfection and to advance its moral purity. From the perspective of the sectarians, orthodox physicians were mere technicians concerned only for the acquisition of data. Sectarians, by contrast, claimed insight into grand theories of unifying truth. They were the medical idealists of the 19th century. From the 1860s on, William and Catherine Booth and the extended family went frequent trips to the Victorian hydros, where it was asserted that vital function could be recharged, the body almost like a battery, in part by a lifestyle which mimicked childhood state of de innocent dis uh, dependence. Early bedtimes, early rising, abstention from a whole list of substance and activities regarded as stimulants, wine, tobacco, coffee, tea, condiments, playing cards, Taking the waters involved a daily regime of hot packs, baths, and long history taking consultations with the therapist. However, there's no direct evidence that William Booth himself bought into or promoted the perfectionist theories underlying these alternative health systems. There was little wholehearted embrace of the metaphysical theories colorfully described by historian Catherine Albanese as expressing a conflation of the impulses of enlightenment and evangelical thought swiftly going to romantic 
sea. Notwithstanding the Army's holiness heritage and transatlantic influences, health practices were infrequently linked with a rhetoric of personal purity. As in the salvationist approach to methods of evangelization, what mattered most was what seemed to work. Consequently, homeopathy, hydrotherapy, vegetarianism were promoted in army periodicals with a rather atypical hesitancy. For example, with the, with the exception of the addiction treatment protocols, the Booths refused to make vegetarianism a matter of order within the Salvation Army. This did not prevent Florence and Bramwell Booth from speaking or publishing on the subject for groups such as the London Vegetarian Society. They contended that a vegetarian diet was biblical, economical, and physiologically adequate. Yes, they believed there were moral dimensions to the vegetarian cause. Diet played, uh, because they main, maintained, I'm sorry, that veg products were non-stimulating, they argued that meatless meals could help the individual avoid temptation. Vegetarianism was favorable to purity, to chastity, to perfect control of the appetites and passions. Elaborate physiological theories equated the consumption of meat uh, with the propensity to alcoholism. The slaughter of animals of, for food was regarded as a brutalizing influence on industry workers. Quote, the highest sentiments of humane men revolt at the cruelty, the degrading sights, the distressing cries, the perpetual bloodshed, and the attendant horrors which must surround the transit and slaughter of suffering creatures. As had been the case a century earlier with Wesley's um, promotion of physics, much of the army's utilization of alternative therapies rep represented a pragmatic response to missional needs. What was unique was how much of the embrace of irregular medicine uh, represented a response not to the needs of the poor, but to the health needs of the officer corps. And I am just gonna skip one forward one slide here, Tabitha. The ministry practice of Salvationist clergy or officers at late century closely approximated that of Methodist itinerants a century earlier. The average length of stay in an appointment or posting was six months. During that time, the officer would conduct an average of 400 indoor and outdoor services, about 15 a week. In an article in the Contemporary Review in 1898, John Hollins, who was a professional journalist and lay member or soldier of the army wrote, we seem to be working up to the extreme limit of our powers of endurance. We have no margin of strength. We lack some element of calm. We have scarcely a green place for rest and recuperation. Robert Brown, who became the denomination's medical advisor in 1903, claimed to have been astonished and disturbed by his clinical experience among army clergy. He wrote, many very active and enthusiastic army officers break down completely within a comparatively short time. This should not happen and would not happen if they exercised ordinary foresight and care in regulating their daily round of, care, of toil. The physician asserted that officers, quote, must obey the laws of health, which are the laws of God. They must learn to reject zeal without discretion. Unfortunately, patterns of health indiscretion had been established early between 1879 and 1894. Over 500 officers were treated at Mr. Smedley's hydropathic establishment, one of the largest centers of alternative medicine in Victorian Britain. To medicalize the need for the rest that a hydro provided was to legitimate it. With an apologetic commitment to what the army characterized as aggressive Christianity, these 19th century missioners regarded themselves as shock troops 
in the winnable war for the souls of men. In the heat of spiritual conflict, sacrifices were required. Suffering was inevitable. And so the Salvationist emphasis on health remained utilitarian. Officers were encouraged to recognize, yes, the role health could play as a recruitment strategy. Healthy people would create a good impression as to what religion would do for people. Health accrued economic advantage to the organization. A man or a woman who had good health could live upon a much smaller income than one who was ailing or sick. Health ensured better troop deployment. But declarations of the Army's priorities remained explicit. Soldiers were summoned to engagement in a war against sin and the devil on the side of a Christ who, quote, flung aside contemptuously the thought that living in this world was a real benefit. In a sermon preached in the summer of 1880, Catherine Booth took as her text, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. And her sermon summed up her religious views. The very essence and core of religion is God first, and allegiance and obedience to him first. If I cannot keep my health and be faithful to him, then I must sacrifice it. If I cannot keep my life and be faithful to him, then I must be prepared to lose it and lay my neck upon the block if need be. This is my religion, and I do not know any other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for a fascinating uh, presentation. And yes, the topic that most of us, even people who know this history, are, are not familiar with and hasn't been discussed very much. So, so interesting. And I'll just remind anyone who has a question, please uh, feel free to type it into the chat and we will uh, take them up from there. Um, a couple of things for clarification. I, I just wonder, can you talk about um, the connection, if there is one, uh, to temperance. I mean, I think you mentioned temperance at some point, but I mean, all, all of our uh, holiness denominations that were temperance movements at one point or were involved in that in various levels. So is it, what's the, the relationship there between this Victorian concern for health and, and the temperance movement, mm -hmm. if there is one? Mm. I mean, it, it was very, very much interconnected and a lot of it transatlantic. I mean, we, we see a lot of it coming out of groups like uh, places like Oberlin College. We see um, uh, Jennings early, uh, early health reformers who, who very quickly seem to uh, assume that meat and many of these practices, this notion of stimulants that, that stirred up the appetites and then created an increased propensity to alcoholism. So they were always looking for ways to control uh, stimulating uh, influences or impulses. Um, I don't know if you want me to go, you know, where beyond that, James, you'd really want me to go. Was there connection? Absolutely. Yes, there was the temperance movement. Oh, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and I was really fascinated by the idea of connecting this to prevenient grace in Wesley's thinking. Mm. And, it sounded like it was mostly though on the natural side, like would Wesley have understood uh, from your reading human creativity and ingenuity in medicine as also an effect of prevenient grace or was it more of a dichotomy? I, I think it was. I think the fact that he himself incurred, uh, was so drawn to the sciences, to the physical scientists, sciences that he found such joy in it himself I think his whole notion of human reason, you know, that as God had, had gifted uh, humanity with reason, the expectation as part of moral governance uh, would be that it would be used in these ways. But I think he was very edgy about um, dismissing what was natural. I, I didn't explain the whole tea thing. Why didn't he like the tea thing? Uh, partly because he felt in his own personal experience that it created tremors. So he said, you know, it causes me to get jumpy. But then also he said, look around England. We have all kinds of herbal teas. They're cheap. They're unadulterated. They're pure. They're healing. Um, you know, take advantage, explore, discover, 
and you will find in the natural creation all kinds of natural cures. And of course they did, I mean, quinine, you know, things for malaria, um, his experience in Georgia, where he, he was fascinated by what he saw in indigenous medicine and, it, and some of its effectiveness. So I think, uh, I think there he's commenting on the extreme use of chemicals uh, out, you know, that he, he found. Listen, let's go to the purest, the simplest. Right, uh, okay, helpful. A question from Amy Patterson. She says, you mentioned concern regarding the effects of slaughter on workers. Was there additional concern for animal welfare? Yes, there was. And we find this very early in Catherine Booth. She writes about it consistently. Now they also did some strange things. I mean, there's one bit in one of the stories where one of the family dogs dies. And so they stuff it, make it an ornament, you know, I mean, some of these things which strike us as truly bizarre. Uh, but yes, there was uh, very much so. And in fact, there are provisions in army documents, I, I think still in the junior soldiers pledge uh, wasn't there a phrase there, some could correct me, that, that talks about cruelty to animals, uh, that, that one avoids it as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, I should also have mentioned that this vegetarian, that this whole putrefication uh, imagery, uh, there wasn't a pure food act passed in Britain until the 1860s. So they say about a third of the meat that people were consuming was in fact polluted, compromised meat. So there was also even a you know, very practical physical um, component there. Did that answer that for Amy? <laughs> Not mm -hmm. enough. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. And, and John Wesley, again, there's a connection there because he was also very concerned with uh, you know, the tr proper treatment of animals and abuse of animals. Um, I don't know if you know an answer to this one. Uh, Kathy asked, does the Salvation Army have a current statement, positional statement on alternative medicine? Uh, I don't know. Not that I am aware of. That you're aware of, yeah. That's, it's, I mean, it's a very contemporary topic in a lot of ways, isn't it? But the whole conversation's changed, of course, but there's, this is still a very contemporary issue. I, I was thinking about that, you know, today and thinking, you know, so there's a lot of things I didn't even go into. Uh, they saw this both in both Wesley and Booth's. I was thinking the reference that came up earlier to the, to the sermon on visiting the sick. Um, they very much saw the provision of care as, quote, softening the soil for the reception of the gospel. Both Wesley and that phrase used later in the Salvation Army. Uh, but I was thinking about this alternative medicine in the 19th century was fulfilling a bit of the role that social media is fulfilling now, at least in the perspective of orthodox medicine. They said, come on, you know, you're writing for patrons, not, not uh, uh, academic peers, right? Um, you need to be more careful in the information that is put out there um, because of all of the, the capacity for misuse. Um, the homeopathy, which I didn't go into, um, was very much linked in the early parts of the 19th century to what worked. For example, in the cholera epidemic of uh, both, well, both going back to Napoleon's uh, trips with the troops, and then the cholera epidemics, the homeopathic hospital statistics were better than uh, their, their survival statistics were better an orthodox medicine of the day. And you say, well, why is that? Well, at least they weren't doing any harm, right? They weren't bleeding them and leeching them and killing them, dumping them to death. And therefore it was assumed, okay, here's evidence-based medicine. This is more effective than what we're seeing in conventional medical currently. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, very good. We've got a few others that have come in here. Um, Dennis asks if there's uh, references or connection and research connecting to um, hospitalers or the writings of Ellen G. White, Seventh Day Adventist. You know, they're also a connection to vegetarianism. Very much. I don't. I I did not see. Well, they were all reading from a common source, but you're absolutely right. Ellen White, the Kellogg's, Troll, uh, all of these American health reformers. Uh, it, the, the language is very, very similar, and especially in terms of this rhetoric of 
purity, pure foods, pure non-stimulating foods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any, this is from Robbie Donaldson. He asks, you mentioned addiction treatment protocols in the mid 19th century. Was it only avoidance of meat, for instance, or were there others that you have reference or further information about, you know, those addiction? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> that could be um, a whole other paper, I think. It, could it? Be. it yeah. is a whole other paper. It is a whole other <laughs> paper. Um, I've been absolutely fascinated. Now we're, we're talking now later 19th century by the, by the time the Salvation Army is actively one thing was very much the notion of uh, locating the addiction uh, therapy, therapeutic environment, which was to be home-like and cozy and unquestioning, not putting a whole a bunch of barriers up to either admission or falling away. Take them back. Doesn't matter how many falls you've had. Take them back. Take them back. Um, uh, softening again the code kind of thing was very much the army's strategy. And then, yes, they did have a whole diet that they prescribed for detox. They had a whole set of, uh, of therapeutic of foods that they felt were more appropriate for, for um, ongoing addiction recovery. And meat was not part of it. Right. <laughs> Okay. Um, we are at our time, but again, I'll do what I did this morning. And if there's people who want to stay, if you need to go and, and take your break before we start again at uh, 2.30, please feel free to do so. But Barb, if you're okay to answer a couple more questions yeah. uh, for one, those who are interested, go ahead. Uh, yeah. One thing on the addictions, I think I kind of half, I ended my sentence halfway. They put the center in proximity of the community, the worshiping community so that there would be fellowship and friendship. They felt that was really important that these not be detached. I'm sorry. Right. No, a very important point. Um, okay, we'll do two more. Uh, was there a decisive point when the Salvation Army's theology and practice moved away from hydrotherapy, vegetarianism, homeopathic medicine, or was this a general slide away from these concepts? And that comes from uh, Mary Beth Swanson. Um. Well, by the last quarter of the 19th century, orthodox medicine is seeing some real success. For example, they now have antiseptic medicine, you know, so the surgical uh, rates had dropped from like 60% of people die after surgery down to about four by the end of the century. Uh, so they were also finding that, you know, a medical practitioner was effective, but they still maintain this kind of, uh, uh, let's try, uh, Catherine Booth and Florence would send off cadets to the orthodox physician. In two cases, I can think of where the recommendation was amputation. And then the Booth said, hey, wait a minute, don't take the leg off yet. Send them back to us. Let us treat them with water therapy first, right? Uh, and they did, and they saved the legs, right? So it moves to more of, more of a complementary relationship. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, and a full medical department into the 1890s, uh, preparing people for overseas missions, for example. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. Last question, Patricia Ryan. Are you available? Are you aware that William Booth associated with the eating of meat with violence? And then she says the children's home in Southeast London had a diet of vegetables organically grown. Uh, had who had I didn't. Children's home, the children's home in Southeast London had a diet of vegetables organically grown, which is just saying that William Booth associated eating meat with violence. Absolutely, he did. Yeah. They go so far as to say it's that's, that, I mean, it sounds bizarre that, you know, many of these people, they said, who are now murderers got their training as butchers in the butcher's shop. They absolutely mm. equated uh, meat eating and the slaughter of animals with, with violence. And they did some very bizarre uh, experiments, um, not the booths, but they relied or looked to things like feeding bears. They thought in zoos, if they gave them vegetables, they wouldn't be carnivores anymore. Kind of so there's a lot of fascinating um, backdrop. Wow, interesting. Well, and, and, and John Wesley, you know, he speculated that, you know, there would be animals in the, in the new creation and, and that the carnivorous animals would not be carnivorous anymore. That was, yes. He, he, yes. he believed, right, they would lose that because he saw this as a, 
a problem that these animals can only survive by killing other animals. This bothered him. Yes. So uh, there's there's yes. lots of fascinating connections. So thank you so much for this uh, paper. Really enjoyed it. Very stimulating. And, and uh, as I say, lots of things that most of us have not heard about or encountered, but at the same time, very contemporary as well. So thank you. And uh, uh, hopefully many of you are going to join us uh, at uh, 2.30 for our papers by either Jerry Milkey on Christian Perfection or Jason Mills on online pastoral education. Thank you again, Barb. Thank you. Thank you.